Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher. Today on God is Open, we're going to be talking about the prophecy of the virgin birth. I got pulled up on the screen the word that's used for virgin, parthenos. And this is the root of today's discussion. So within Matthew, we have a statement that the birth of Jesus fulfills a prophecy. We've talked before about this fulfillment language as it's found in the New Testament writers and their sense of prophecy fulfillment. It's not our sense of prophecy fulfillment. It's not like in 10 years you're going to trip over a rock and break your leg and then all those things fulfill, something like that. There's no crystal balls involved. There's no mu movies of the future. Instead, what's happening when people are alluding to the Old Testament, it's illusions. It's They're drawing on principles in order to highlight points. This is, it's, it's not... It's not magic, as Michael Heiser says. So we'll, we'll pull up Michael Heiser and see what he says about prophecy as used within particularly the book of Matthew in this quote. Matthew was instantly reminded of verses like Hosea 11.1 1, and the way the Messiah and the nation were identified with each other in his Bible elsewhere, the Old Testament. Seeing the points of analogy was led by the Spirit to note the connection in his gospel. There is no need to view Hosea 11.1 1 as a prophecy that pointed to Jesus. Rather, a gospel writer saw an analogy and interpreted that analogy as something God intended to be made clear once the Messiah had come. We could consider it typology or simple analogy. Either way, it made sense to Matthew, and I think it isn't hard for us to now see the sense of it. It's not magic. So Michael Heiser is saying that this type of uh, use of the word fulfillment, it's either typology or analogy. It's something to keep in mind. Turning to a non-Christian, Joe Hoffman, he says this in the book, God Didn't Say That. A proof text is text that is used to demonstrate a point. This isn't a proof in the modern scientific sense, though. The proof text does not have to prove anything, and the proof text doesn't even have to mean the same thing as what it's demonstrating. The point of using a proof text was that it was considered better to use the words of Scripture than to invent new ones, even if the words of the Scripture were taken out of context. The whole notion of a text matching and a proof text is generally foreign to our modern way of thinking, but it was central to how the texts were understood 2,000 years ago. So he says the proof text doesn't even have to mean the same thing as what's demonstrating. It's just a better use of words. This is uh, the proof by analogy, a proof by pointing to past patterns, past events. This is how this is being used. This is even admitted by our Calvinist friends over at the Gospel Coalition. Let's read what they have to say. Keep in mind the New Testament's purpose in referencing the Old Testament. We often think that every time the Old Testament is referenced, it must mean the New Testament author is trying to exegete the Old Testament passage. But there is no rule of inerrancy which says a New Testament author must always be, in a, be attempting to give a correct interpretation of a given passage. The New Testament author may not be attempting an interpretation at all. If someone asks me, how's the editing work going? And I say, it's tedious line upon line, precept upon precept. This doesn't mean I'm trying to exegete Isaiah 28.10. I'm simply employing the familiar language of a familiar passage. Along these lines, remember that New Testament often uses the Old Testament simply as a vehicle of expression. The New Testament writers were hugely familiar with the Old Testament. It's no wonder they employed its vocabulary. In the same way, Westerners might use a line from Shakespeare or the Bible because it's familiar, but without intending to explain the context or the original meaning. The New Testament may press home the significance of a passage without trying to explain its original meaning. For example, Moo points to Paul's use of Deuteronomy 25.4. You shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. In 1 Corinthians 9.9, critics argue that Paul is taking the law of Moses out of context by saying that this passage is about paying ministers. But surely Paul is justified in pulling a fair inference out of a passage and applying it to his own context. Prophecy fulfillment in the New Testament, typically, most likely, it's going to be this typology parallelism, referencing Old Testament events to point the truth of current events, not crystal ball prediction. So all these sources are kind of saying the same thing. So let's turn to the prophecy as we find in Matthew. It's all centered around this word. Matthew's written in Greek. The Greek word is parthenos. It's a virgin. 
We start in Matthew 1.18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way when his mother, Mary, had been betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Let's scroll down. Joseph is appeared to. His fears are alleviated. It says, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Scroll down. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord has spoken uh, by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. So look at that. So this has been fulfilled, the statement that a virgin is going to conceive. Isn't it miraculous? It's a miracle that someone who has not had sexual relations conceives and the idea that someone who has not had sexual relations and conceiving is found in the Old Testament, this is a miraculous prophecy fulfillment. But we've got problems. Let's turn to atheist George H. Smith. He writes this, As an example of the distortion and context dropping that resulted, consider the first reference to prophecy in the New Testament, referring to the supposed virgin birth of Jesus. The author of Matthew writes, Quote, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Matthew 1, 22, 23. This is a reference to the Old Testament passage, Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. He follows up. He says this. To begin with, this appeal to prophecy is based on mistranslation. The Hebrew word all mob, which means young woman or maiden, is made to read virgin, for which the Hebrew is Bethula, by the author of Matthew, thus conveniently switching the Old Testament passage to meet his particular requirements. According to the interpreter's Bible, if Isaiah had wished to make clear that he had in mind a miraculous virgin birth, he would have had to use the specific term Bethula. The King James translation retains the mistranslation of Isaiah 7.14 as virgin, but the more honest Revised Standard Version correctly renders it young woman. So, look at what uh, George H. Smith says. He says, Matthew, the author of Matthew, when we're reading that, and Matthew reads that, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. This is a contrivance on Matthew's part. Matthew's making up a prophecy. He's tweaking words in the Old Testament to kind of meet the current situation. Mary, a virgin, gives birth. Wow, you turn to the Old Testament and uh, you just got to change a word here or there. And Matthew changes this word and now you have prophecy fulfillment. That, that's what George H. Smith is claiming here. And you see where he's coming from. He's been misled by Christians uh, probably for some time about this passage and how this is used and what this word means. So let's take a look to see if who's actually doing the mistranslation. Is the author of Matthew doing the mistranslation? Or maybe it's modern audiences. Maybe it's the translator into English of that word. The first notable instance is Genesis twenty four sixteen. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden whom no man had known. So that's an interesting phrase. So if the word automatically meant virgin, does should there be another sentence explaining that she has not had sexual relations with a man? Maybe, maybe kind of inconclusive. I would, I would uh, kind of think that this is not uh, putting down a double meaning in two different sentences. I think it's explaining what type of virgin or what type of young woman that this is using that word. Let's look at our next reference. So this is in context of the defiling of Dinah, Genesis 34, 3. And his soul, soul was drawn to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman and spoke tenderly to her. Now, this, this she is also described as a young woman. Uh, the verse as translated in the King James says damsel, but it's the word. It's the same word being used in Matthew for virgin, but he loves her, but the problem is that this is after the sexual encounter, whether it be rape or seduction, some sort of sexual uh, contact. This is after that she is still being described as a virgin. So this is this is a fairly clear. There there might be a argument 
to be made that it's everything simultaneous so the author still considers her some sort of virgin something like that uh more likely this this word just means young woman and young women tend to be virgins and so a lot of the contexts of this word um, they're considered virgin virgins but not necessarily let's look at our next reference this is Isaiah 47.1. Of course, this word is used throughout uh, the Septuagint, but it's being used here to describe Babylon. It says, Come now and sit in the dust, O virgin daughter of Babylon. Sit on the ground, there is no throne, O daughter of the Chaldeans, for thou shalt no more be called tender and delicate. So this goes on to talk about the shame of this young woman, the, this quote-unquote virgin. And... Uh, <laughs> They, they've polluted their inheritance. Um, she's she's uh, very haughty. They, they, she says, I'll never know loss of children, things like that. It seems to be that the word here is not properly translated virgin, but young woman. A young woman who has had lots of flings, perhaps, and has had children through those flings. That, that seems to be the idea being communicated. Now, this is not relegated to the Septuagint. There are other references outside the Bible to this word being used, and not in the sense of a virgin, instead as a young lady. And so this word, contrary to what George Smith says, this word is not properly, the Greek word is not properly translated virgin. It's actually properly translated by Matthew when he translates it young woman. It's the correct word to use. It's the correct word to represent the original Hebrew. They both mean young women. Young women tend to be virgins, so you tend to have context about virginity. But not all young women are virgins. In the Old Testament, this word is particularly used for young unmarried women. Women who may or may not be virgins, but who are unmarried and young. So now turning back to Matthew, Perhaps we could entertain the idea that it's not the Matthew, the author of Matthew, who gets this wrong in translation, but it's the English translator translating from the Greek. The word just doesn't have to mean virgin. So why would everyone and their dog translate this virgin? It's because they're looking for prophecy fulfillment. They're looking for modern prophecy. They need something in the Old Testament to state that some unmarried woman who has not had sex will conceive in the future. And if you go look at Matthew, that's what happens. An unmarried woman who has not had sex then conceives and has a baby. They need that to match up. They need that to match up particularly because the prophecy would not make sense to them if that's not a key feature. So if the prophecy is about just something just normal happening, uh, some guy will stub his toe in the future. That's not a very good prophecy. And uh, if this if this was actually translated correctly, behold, a young woman will conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is like not Jesus' name. That, that, that should be our tip off there. Jesus' name is not Emmanuel, um, however you want to spin that. And so if it's just there's going to be a woman who has a baby, that's not very miraculous. It, it, doesn't, it doesn't speak to some sort of out there prophecy that's definitive and saying, uh, see, look at this. this. This miraculous thing was predicted and this miraculous thing came about. Instead, what's happening is God chose a woman at a previous point of time in Isaiah to have a kid. The kid's born at the time. Go read the passage. He exists in that time frame and that, that's God's sign to the king at that time. It's, it's not about a future event. God is just choosing someone to have a kid to fulfill some sort of purpose for him that again repeats itself in matthew that god is having a child to fulfill a purpose that uh, he has designated that's the parallel people who want this to be a prophecy can't have that be the parallel they can't have that be what the prophecy is talking about because that just doesn't make sense how that could be a prophecy that has any weight at all it's not like in exactly 200 years, something very, very specific is going to happen. Something out of the ordinary that doesn't happen every single day of every single year. This has to be one of their types of prophecy. Rather than what it actually is, it's a parallelism. It's an allusion to an Old Testament event to illustrate what's happening in the, that particular time. 
It's using Old Testament language to describe what's happening currently. It's pointing to past events to highlight the truth of current events. This is not American Nostradamus type prophecy. It's ancient Israelite illusion. All right. I hope that was helpful. I hope uh, everyone got something out of that. You have questions or comments, put that down below or start a thread on the God is Open Facebook page. Thank you for listening.